This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 185 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Hands On Gloves, the all-in-one shedding, bathing, grooming gloves. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have horsewomen. They cared enough to start nonprofits, and they help horses and the people who love them. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me off the road today. Got you back in the studio. Off the road and back into the studio. Yay! Mm -hmm. Yeah, no more road trips for you now. No, did you have fun? Uh, We had fun. We had a equal measure of fun, panic, uh, disillusionment, oh. uh, frustration. A lot of work, <laughs> I can tell. It was it was our test trip. We yeah. we went out for a week on the road with our RV, be, and visited various and sundry listeners and friends farms and broadcast the shows from there and basically did our podcasting thing from there. And we were practicing because in the month of August. We're going to go out and do that for an entire month. And if you, yeah, if you want to know more about that, you just need to go to horseradionetwork.com and there'll be stuff on there about the HRN Roadshow. Follow them. Road trip. Road trip. All right. Yeah. Road hip. (laughs) And speaking of road trips, you've been putting on the miles on your (laughs) car, on your brain, on your cell phone, because the movement... The movement is coming up. The big thing. This is the third year for the movement? Fourth. Can you believe it? The fourth year for the movement. Give me the quick Reader's Digest version of what the Mm. movement is for those who are not in the know. Not in the know. Go to themovement2021.com and you'll learn a lot of stuff in there. But, you know, it is so much fun. What we decided about four years ago, or I guess probably five, and then we pulled it off in the fourth, is that... Uh, we we hold a lot of things close to our vest here. There's just so many cool things going on from different areas with our programs of, for veterans, our programs for kids, our programs for training people to be certified, the students that come from all over the world that we thought it would be cool to pull together a weekend where everybody comes together and talks about all these cool things they're doing to take violence out of horses and training and how that bridges the therapeutic qualities for people. And we flipped over the the feeling that we're always helping horses. You know, everybody mm-hmm. wants to help horses and that's cool. But we went, wait a minute, I think actually horses help us. And what does that look like? And we have we've had these speakers every year that are phenomenal. And like with Temple Grandin last year when we did the live streaming because COVID happened and we went so what? You're not going to stop us. <laughs> you can't stop us. Mm. So we had Dr. Siemens and we had Ashley Mancuso and we had Jamie Jennings and we had Monty Roberts and Temple, as I said, and um, and others. We had a, one of our certified instructors, who um, Ellie Boardman, who called in all the way over, zoomed in and had her big picture right there on the round pin from England. Then Germany, we had Denise Heinlein, our instructor, who was stuck over there in Europe, too. And they both did a amazing presentation. So it, it was really cool and really fun. And of course, Temple was in her kitchen in, in, in Colorado. And but they she could see the Mustang in the round pen and dad could see her on the screen. And then Dr. Siemens could see her from the edge of the round pen and they could all talk and say, what's that horse doing right there? And what do you do? And it, really, really cool. Well, this year, what do you do? Right? You've got COVID still happening. It's January or so, and you really have to make a decision what you're going to do. And we thought by that time, you know, everybody was really fatigued at staring at a screen because that's what they do for work anymore, right? And they didn't want to do that kind of thing anymore. So we thought, we'll just we'll just make a decision to make it very intimate, very high-end, very participatory. That means that we'll have 50 only tickets 
to this, 50 people that are really committed to the concepts. We'll bring in our trailblazers, and that's Ashley Avis, who made Black Beauty last fall that came out for Disney, and who is committed to making, a, she's making it right now, a documentary about the Mustangs. And it's a little different on the angle for the Mustangs, very positive and very informative. And then we have Marty Irby, who has been Animal Wellness Foundation is what he um, works for. And his organization has been super proactive in helping horses get drugs out of thoroughbred racing, uh, Tennessee walking horses, the big lick. Um, He really goes after the tough topics. We've got Jamie Jen here, who is ASPCA's trainer of the year for the right horse initiative program that they have, which is pretty fabulous. And of course, she's a certified Monty Roberts instructor. So she and Monty are coming to play with the gentling wild horses. And then we've got Monty and they're going to be in the gentling pen with we've got five feral horses to work with, some from um, New Mexico. And they're kind of like grade Mustangs. They're feral. And we've got these uh, big there's some Percheron in them, but they grow up in the mountains up here in San Inez and they have to survive the cougars and they have to survive the rattlesnakes and, but they don't, they're not afraid of people. So it's really cool. They're completely feral, but they see people because they're in the mountaintop here and they come down for some, we throw some alfalfa out there and, you know, and um, they're big and they're beautiful and people will remember them from the movement. Uh, Coffee and cream were kind of made famous a couple years ago <laughs> and they're just adorable. And so we've got more of those guys. We've got, uh, we've got a whole Elton John uh, theme going. There's Benny, there's Jet, there's uh, Rocket Man. There's <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, anyway, so that's that's the horses that we'll be introducing too. But only fifty lucky people get to be here, and um, we're we're really excited about it. That wasn't a very thumbnail sketch of the movement. <laughs> well, it's a it's a big concept, I think, because the movement is unique in its mission and its point of view. Because you're right, we talk a lot about helping horses and the movements. Um, point of view is how horses help humans and how we can advance that. So it's, it's, I think it's genuinely unique in the industry in that it, it, that's the only focus of the entire program. But you guys have been doing this, this is year four, and years one, two, and three, you can still partake, can't you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jen, because everything dad does, you know, we, we, video and we keep and we churn out lessons on our online university that's monty roberts university.com and um, we put them up after the event it takes a few weeks to edit it all down because we have two cameras rolling but we put it on monty roberts.com on the top of that home page there is a tab and it says the movement v o d v is in victor o ostrich d dog i don't obviously not very military on that but so, or if you it, please that means video on demand it means it that too it does i was going to teach them that thank you for doing that that's good though <laughs> because i didn't know what v o d was like why did you put v o d on the tab I'm like oh video oh, on demand i get it go. okay <laughs> so yeah, up there though they'll see the past years um that are um, put up there as soon as we get it edited and done. So people won't miss out. So if you got major FOMO, fear of missing out, see, I'll teach you all these acronyms. And then don't worry, um, just because you can't travel or, you know, you're worried about doing that, you can still get a chance to see these. And you can see the ones from past years, whether you were here or not, you can go back and video on demand it. See, there you go. So you just go to bonnieroberts.com at the top of the page the movement V O D. And that brings you to a page that has all of the movement videos, which are the entire symposium um, yeah. blo- right. brought down into a clear, concise, informative and enjoyable video. But you also have on there a lot of other videos from mm-hmm. Monty's. You've you got some backstage patches on passes on there and some other stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we have some highlights. The trailers are really fun just to watch to see which one you want to start with. Like uh, there's a beautiful Cromello stallion all fired up going around a round pen. If you look at that, that's last year's with Temple Grandin and all those people I just talked about. Uh, but they have the other ones too. 2019 and 2018 is up there and, and other things of interest. It's better than YouTube, you guys. YouTube is kind of messy video. These, these are beautifully done. 
Yes, they're they are professionally produced, so they they rock as far as production mm-hmm. value is concerned. You do you do a good job with that. There yeah. we go. Well, that's what's going on at uh, Flag is Up Farms for now. We'll later in the show, like we always do, we will get through get to the calendar, which will mm-hmm. tell you what's going on for the next three months or so. Yeah, if you're interested in that. So if you are not going to the movement in person, and if you want to go to the movement in person, just go to MontyRoberts.com, look up the phone number, give them a holler on the phone. You'll talk to a real live human being who knows what's going on. Yep. And save it for next year. I think we'll be at June again next year. So long-term planners. There There you go. go. And speaking of long-term planning, long-term planning, you need to probably replace some of the grooming tools in your grooming box. I just noticed that today. Some of my grooming tools are looking a little ratty. So if you haven't done so already, you need to check out Hands On Gloves, who are our title sponsor. So let's hear from them before we get to our first guest. Well, I'm sitting here today with Jay Michelson of Hands On Gloves. And we were talking today about the horse that has sensitive skin or the animal that has sensitive skin, Jay. And I I wanted you to help me address that a little bit. I know you've got some features to your products, but I know you know more about it than I do. So what do you do? What do you say to the, the owner that has somebody with sensitive skin? Our gloves are made from surgical grade nitrile. So that makes them chemical resistant, mildew resistant, because you can bathe with them too. They're made to get wet. Um, but across the board, there's no latex in them. So it's great for any animal, any people that have latex issues. There's no latex in it. They're just your hands. And if you have a thin skin horse or dog, they're, they're cats, other animals. There are many animals that don't like to be touched in certain areas. But having the gloves on, it's just your hands. You get immediate feedback if you get to an area of that animal that is sensitive. And you can apply less pressure in those areas, and you can apply more pressure in the other areas. Um, We have professional grooms that work from us. Um, They groom for Olympians across the board, and these guys are phenomenal. And they did a study on mainly thoroughbreds, thin skin thoroughbreds. Mm -hmm. And they found out that most people are grooming too light. (laughs) Oh, interesting. They're tickling the the horses and went and applied just a little more pressure and the horses loved it. Ah. And that's kind of some of our experience with it. We we have all kinds of animals and experience with that. I think you can throw these in the wash machine. Am I right? You can. Next time you bathe your animals with them, use the gloves. A little bit of soap suds up all the way. And what we do after we bathe our animals with them, we rinse them off, hang them out to dry, and they go back to new. Um, you can throw them in the washing machine. Um, just don't put them in the dryer. And okay. um, just throw them in the washing machine, hang them out to dry, and they go back to new. Well, Jay, how do people find out about you? Handsongloves.com. Bonnie McRae is the founder and director of After the Races, a nonprofit in Elkton, Maryland, whose mission is to rehabilitate and rehome retiring racehorses into long term homes while promoting the versatility and usefulness of the breed beyond racing. Bonnie grew up around horses and began working professionally with the thoroughbreds right out of university. She worked in many aspects of the racehorse industry, from starting youngsters for the track to exercising and managing racehorses, including some graded stakes winners. While she also handled broodmares and foals, she always gravitated toward the rehabilitation and training side of the industry. For fun, Bonnie enjoys pursuing endurance and eventing riding with her own horses and even completed the Mongol Derby in 2014. Well, welcome, Bonnie McRae. What a great name, too. Bonnie, I'm so happy to have you at Flag is Up Farms, and you are interning here as uh, a part of our transition horse program. But I wanted to learn a little bit more about you and what got you here first. I know we've we've read that you're the founder and director of After the Races. Um, I definitely want to hear about that. But I'd like to hear how you got into horses. We always like to know your horsey background first. How'd you, how'd you meet horses in your life? Sure. And, uh, you know, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as, as far as how I got introduced to horses, I was introduced by, in the same way I think a lot of people are introduced to horses, and that I was signed up for horseback riding lessons when I was nine years old uh, by my parents. And 
my parents are not horsey people themselves, but I think they recognized that I seem to somewhat lack the propensity for those kind of team group sports that a lot of kids like to get into. Mm -hmm. You know, I was always a bit of an introverted child that really enjoyed the company of animals a bit more towards people, like I think many of us can relate. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to give this a try and see how it went. And, you know, I think, of course, they had no idea at the time that they would be creating this spark (laughs) and setting me up for this lifelong, you know, career with horses that ended up happening. So... I love that. I love that parents can reach for things that they're not even familiar with, but kind of recognize those qualities that um, help a kid, help a horse, whatever it is, too. And we're so glad that you chose horses and stayed in the industry and, you know, as a lot of women do. But you've taken it to a new level. I, I was amazed by this first internship that I read about that you were in your background, that you interned with a Jude Monte Farms. How do you say that? Jude Mont- Monte Farms? <laughs> Judmont Farms. Judmont Farms. There we go. Yeah. Got to give yeah, them credit. Judmont. Yeah. Oh, and man, they, they are amazing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about because you assisted in starting 72 young horses for the track at Judmont Farms. Tell us That's about correct. that operation. Yeah. Yeah. So Judmont is actually um, a farm that is has several locations throughout the world. They, they are world renowned really for being one of the best or most successful thoroughbred breeding operations in the world, as well as potentially racing outfits as well. And they really believe in education. So they hire a lot of interns, both independently on their own, as well as through this program that I participated in, which is called the Kentucky Equine Management Internship. And this is an internship program geared towards college graduates who want to kind of get a foothold in the industry and also get a bit more Uh, day-to-day experience managing a horse farm and what all it entails. And I was able to actually um, get one of these training internships with Judmont where we did get to manage horses. We did have our own barns of yearlings that we took care of, but we also got to assist in start to finish the starting of these 72 young thoroughbreds for the racetrack. Um, And it was a really incredible experience uh, and really taught me a lot about training horses. I bet, because you were not only on the ground trainer, but you were also in the saddle, right? Yes, yes. We Mm -hmm. were their first riders, uh, as well as, you know, exercise riders once they got going. And, you know, it really set me up for a lot of success uh, when it comes to riding racehorses. So Yeah, yeah, I bet. Nothing like a university of horses. (laughs) (laughs) You've worked with over a thousand racehorses, too. And you're really, you're way too young for a thousand racehorses. That's (laughs) Pretty darn amazing. So you're pretty ambitious. And so you're probably pretty confident, too, around horses. How much have you worked with the horses that are non-domesticated, you know, feral horses? And not too much. Uh, I, in the United States, for, uh, none at all, really. Um, I was able to participate in something a few years ago called the Mongol Derby, which is a horse race uh-huh. in Mongolia. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually the world's longest horse race. And for that race, we actually, believe it or not, ride semi-feral horses. It's true. Um, to, to compete in the race. So I have had a bit of experience, you know, handling these horses that aren't used to being handled. And actually, I got to go back to Mongolia a few years ago as well and actually get a hand at herding them up and lassoing them and, you know, yeah. bringing, them, bringing them in so that we can work with them. So that's probably the closest I've come to working with untouched. That's pretty close. Oh, that's pretty close <laughs> to what right. more more than uh, probably most people ever get a chance to do because most people don't get to work with the feral horses. And boy, I'd love to have you back to talk about that experience too because I think um, even just hearing about it does teach us a lot. So I'd love mm-hmm. your perspective on that too. Um, but I see in your, I mean, probably the reason, one of the best reasons we have you here is because you started uh after the races, which is a rehab and rehoming operation. And and that's what I really wanted to dig into a little bit. Why did you start that? That's actually a really good question. Um, you know, I think it was kind of a product of several events, you know, culminating to a, uh, the point that it ended up in. You know, I was able to go from working at Judmont Farms with their yearlings and, and horses in training to ultimately, you know, managing and riding racehorses in other capacities, uh, as well as doing a good bit of freelance riding and training for particularly racehorses, but as well as other breeds. And at one point in my life, I actually just found myself renting a a farm uh, or a house on a farm that was a former breeding operation in Pennsylvania. And, you know, I was just kind of looking for 
the next step for myself and became aware of this need for a place, a safe place for horses to come off the racetrack and rehabilitate and, you know, work towards their next career. And they really need a particular type of person, I think, who is very familiar with kind of the ins and outs of the racetrack and racetrack life, as well as the horses themselves. And I felt that I could fill that need. So, um, you know, it really just was a matter of kind of all these little things uh, bringing me to a, a spot where I was able to to start this program. Yeah, I, obviously you felt confident with them because the horses were responding well to you. And I know that's such a hard thing to define in your own self. But what do you think it is about horses that respond to you well? What? How did you handle them in such a way that you felt like you were, that's sort of your superpower? Right. Um, well, when I was a younger younger rider in my teen teenage years, I actually came into possession of this horse that was quite abused. Um, it had been through a rather difficult long-term uh, situation of abuse, unfortunately. And again, my parents stepped in and they're not horse people as I've discussed before. Right. And But they somehow managed to find this trainer who uh, I actually still remember him. His name is David Lowry. And he was this just what we kind of call sort of like a backwoods kind of cowboy down in North Carolina who had a reputation for working with what many people referred to as problem horses. Mm. Of course, as we all know, mostly it's not a problem horse so much the horse (laughs) that has problems with humans. But Mm -hmm. um, in my time working with my horse and with David, uh, he really introduced me to essentially uh, what I now recognize is, you know, Monty Roberts' style of horsemanship, of, you know, a, a matter of training without aggression and developing horses that want to work with you. And it gave me kind of the first taste of that. And then I continued to take that similar approach with me as I progressed, you know, professionally and with my riding career as well. And I've that level of patience and kindness and always giving the horse the benefit of the doubt, you know, really has served me well throughout, I think, every position that I've had, uh, with racehorses, you know, I think they recognize that in a human when they mm-hmm. have that approach versus what the type of approach they're maybe more typically used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the thoroughbreds are so lucky to have you too, because really these are, these are attributes of probably any horse and any breed really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the racehorses do have some disadvantages over, you know, they're not owned by a 12 year old girl who loves them and dotes on them all day. Right. <laughs> they, they, right. Yeah, they're often um, put through a lot of stress. And I like one thing that I read that you wrote that said that the best way to get a horse to work with you is to work within its language. But you didn't really define that. How do you, how would you say you meant that to be? I th- I think a lot of that is really taking a step back and trying to kind of remove the human expectation from the equation. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, when I first work with a horse, you know, I really try to take a step back and look at the horse and what it's telling me, perhaps through its body language, through its reactions, to my movements, to what I ask of it, and really try to kind of develop potentially a history of a horse without having a verbal history ever given to me. Um, you know, I think there's a lot that the horses can tell us about what they're ready for and what they've experienced in the past and being able to kind of read that and then come back to them in a way that they can understand, you know, through your own body language and posture and, um, you know, kind of using that silent, you know, language of horses to, to connect with them. I think that's what I was trying to, yeah. to reference in that do you, statement. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I, and do you ever get those horses that are really glazed over? They're really, oh, yeah. yeah. And what do you, what do you think? What, what's your ability to kind of watch for that breakthrough moment with them? Um, you know, for us, I think a lot of what we do here, everything we focus on it after the race is centers around the rehabilitation of the horse. You know, obviously physical things aside, um, more importantly, almost is the mental rehabilitation of these animals. And mm-hmm. sometimes we get these horses in from the racetrack and perhaps they've been racing, you know, some of them I get are even 12 years old. They've been at the racetrack their entire lives at that point. And some of them have very, you know, wonderful caring connections and some have perhaps maybe a little bit more of a mechanical relationship with the people in it, in their lives. And when the horses come into us with that kind of glazed look that you're talking about, you know, to me, one of the most effective ways to help them is to actually let them just be horses again for a while, you know, take these horses, put them out in a big field with other horses, reintegrate them into a herd and 
I almost let the other horses kind of be the first one mm. to work with them, you know, because yeah. we have these horses that'll come in and, and you put them out in this, you know, big, beautiful eight acre field with tons of grass and horse friends and they'll stand at the gate and pace, you know, mm-hmm. they don't know how to exist in that environment. Um, and it's not every horse, but, um, you know, most times, unless the horse is, you know, perhaps a danger to itself, you know, I tend to just leave it out there. And That's a great uh, idea. Wait, yeah, mm. and just sort of wait for the other horses to start making an effort to bring it in. And sometimes it takes a matter of hours. Sometimes it takes a week. But eventually they start to reconnect with their, you know, kind of natural instincts and that desire to be part of a group. And, you know, so that's that's kind of always been my approach to first let them mm-hmm. re-experience that's what it's like. Well to be said. Well said. I love that. A lot of people say, oh, just be a horse. But, uh, you know, if you if you haven't been around horses a lot, you don't know what that means. What I mean, right. it seems obvious that be a horse is whatever you're, you're, you grew up with. You know, if that's a 12 by 12 stall, that's one thing. If it's pasture horses, that's another thing. But people don't always, that's a good definition. I like that. So I know that you've rehomed uh, over 650 horses, some crazy number like that, and that you're still working with about 100, 120 horses per year. So, man, I got to ask you, you, you get up on those horses and you ride out and, and have other trainers do too. What's your trail look like that you put these thoroughbreds on? Everybody's always curious about how do you get a thoroughbred out on the trail? Oh, like what, what sort of trails they, they experience with mm-hmm. us? Yeah. Uh, we actually are very fortunate. We currently rent, but we have a 77 acre farm wow. that is about 36 acres cleared and about 40 acres of woods. And we have sort of some introductory level trails through those that we've cut through and we have bridle paths around the farm. And, you know, we always do our first kind of out of the arena experience there on the farm. And, you know, usually we follow along a pony horse or a horse that's been in the program a bit longer and just kind of get their feet wet, just existing outside of a confined space. And beyond that, we actually really waste a lot of time. We usually throw the horses on the trailer and three miles from our facility is actually a 6,000 acre park uh, called Fair Hill. And, you know, we can go there and really expose these horses to all kinds of things, you know, from open spaces and woods to, you know, wildlife and rivers and bridges. Even they even have tunnels that we take these horses through. We are so fortunate to have that close by and we go out there at every opportunity we get. I bet. That is awesome. Now, a lot of people say, no, 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 bubble wrap thoroughbreds. You can't, you can't do that. <laughs> but what a great thing for their brains. I, I love that. So yeah. it, it gets me down to the adopters because that's your goal. You, you're mm-hmm. putting these horses back into the next vocation or their next home. And and how do you know you have a good match in in mm-hmm. somebody who's adopting? That's, that's a really good question. We actually, you know, I think a lot of it is, is knowing the horse first and foremost. You know, our experiences with that animal can pretty well tell us, you know, what they're going to be comfortable with. You know, if they're going to be more forgiving for certain things or more resistant to certain things. And in, for the most part, I feel like these retired racehorses often need, you know, rather experienced riders. They need people that have, are pretty confident in their abilities and, you know, kind of know how to kind of get out of a sticky moment if they ever arise. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, not all our, our adopters fit that category. We have quite a few first-time horse owners as well that we work with. Uh, we have horses that have gone on to be police horses and therapy horses and everything in between. And a lot of it, I think, is, is mostly knowing the horse and then also relying on the references and the people we talk to that surround the adopter. Uh, you know, the adopter will tell us their background and and what they think their abilities are, but then also communicating with the people around them to kind of verify that sort of information. And you might find if you learn a little bit more about them that way um, sometimes um, to just sort of, I don't know, just sort of put the pieces together and try to find the best fit. Um, And then of course, if we can see them ride, you know, come to the farm and actually try the horse out, you know, you'll, you can tell straight away, I think if a horse is going to get along with someone. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Whether the person's confident enough to do that too, so uh, and it's great when you've got you're a rider, so um, it's it's wonderful that you can assess like that too. I'm thinking about the the owner right now of a racehorse on the track, and eventually that horse will have to retire, <clears throat> whether it's three years old or as you say, twelve years old in the case of the one. Uh, what what would you like an owner of a racehorse to know? Something that you know now that the 
owner may not be thinking about yet, but would you like them to know? Yeah, I would really like more racehorse owners to think about the future of their horses beyond racing. And that might seem kind of obvious, but I think at the end of the day, most of the people that own these racehorses actually do like horses and they are even very compassionate about their the care of their horses. But a lot of them might not really know what it takes to move on successfully from that career to their next one. Mm-hmm. And I think being able to recognize signs in their horses sooner than later as far as, you know, making that call to retire them before they're used up or before they get a career ending injury, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to really give them that chance to have a successful second career, you know, Mm -hmm. so often people kind of wait until the physical state of the horse demands retirement. Um, And I would really love more consideration to be given um, so that they could, I guess, move on a bit sooner. Uh, mm-hmm. I think quite a, we see quite a few horses that race and you can look at their racing records and they haven't even hit the board or, you know, come in the top three placements uh, in 10, 12 races, you know, and it's like, if you could just sort of make that call a little bit sooner, you know, you'll have a horse that can go on to live a very long, happy, useful life uh, with another owner. And I think at the end of the day, they all would like that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but, so an exit plan, uh, having a little yeah, bit guess, more of an exit plan. Yeah. Yeah. Having more of an exit plan, you know, and, and thinking about that ahead of time, mm-hmm. you know, would be mm-hmm. something I'd really like to see more of them do. Yeah, too. I think that if they knew how versatile thoroughbreds were, that um, that there are training methods that could have them pivot into another career, maybe that exit plan would be more um obvious, I guess, you know, if, if, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, it's one thing I think also that stuck with me when I worked with Judmont Farms is the way they train their horses from the very beginning. You know, we were trail riding these horses before they ever hit the track. Yeah. You know, we were teaching them, we were creating soft mouths and teaching them their leads and, and doing all kinds of things with them out in the pasture before they ever got to the racetrack. And I kind of think too, if more people gave them a a more well-rounded education in the beginning, you know, that would also serve them well. It would create a safer horse to ride at the track, which means it might have a more successful time, but then also really set it up for success in its second career as well. Absolutely. And so much easier to teach them when they're younger, just like us learning a language before five, you know, that if we can get that. Have you uh, had a play yet as your internship progresses here now? Have you had a play with the into pressure pole or, you know, our top pole or anything like that, that does help before you even get in the saddle? Um, Or is that to come? You have? Yeah, good. Yeah, we actually, uh, just yesterday, we were introduced to the top pole and several desensitizing tools as well. And, you know, it's, it's something that I'm going to almost immediately replicate when I get home. Uh, The top pole is, is, it's pretty incredible. Um, I, it's, it seems like such a simple concept, but it's not one that I ever really considered doing prior to this. Uh, you know, it wasn't something that came naturally to me, but it made sense immediately once it was shown to me. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, once, you know, once you know dad, you know that he's more horse than human. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. hey, and he, he did the flat forehead thing and it was like, how come I didn't think of this? I was always, you know, mm-hmm. fixing remedial horses after the fact. Why didn't I think about just training them off pressure before we ever got into the, the situation? So I'm glad that you're still making discoveries here, you know, and that because I know that you've, you've been a Monty student, if I can call you that. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I like what you said about that it is a more efficient way. Some people say, oh, it's too fast. What, how do you, how do you, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I I think efficiency is something to strive for in a lot of aspects of the adoption process with horses. Um, You know, you don't want to do anything so quickly that the horse obviously has a negative experience, but, you know, I've, seen the traditional methods for training horses and I've experienced more of the, you know, Monty Roberts style of training horses. And, you know, sometimes you might be able to come to the same goal at the end of the day using multiple methods, but with the approach that we really practice here at Flag is Up Farms, I feel like you can reach those goals so much more quickly, but also without putting, I feel, any additional stress on the horses. You know, it's, by working with them in such a way that you have this horse that wants to work with you, you know, you can make progress, I think, a lot more quickly than than when you're trying to kind of fight the natural 
um, instincts of the horse and, okay. and sort of force it to do what you want it to do. Well um, said. Well said, Bonnie McRae. I love that. Thank <laughs> you. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're you're a lifelong long learner. And uh, we're just really fortunate to have you as an intern here. And I hope the horses love you as much as we all do. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm very excited to be here and, and absolutely will be taking uh, what I'm learning here back home to help benefit our horses at After the Races. So Good. So people go to aftertheraces.org um, or do you like them to come to your Facebook page? How do they get a hold of you? Either way is fine. Uh, we have a pretty active social media presence, but if you want to contact us, probably the best way is through our website. Okay. All right. Aftertheraces.org, just like it sounds. And I'd love to have you back to talk about that Mongolian experience too. Can we do that? Yes, please. I'd love to. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us today on Horsemanship Radio. Hi, Debbie. I just had to write and tell you how much I'm enjoying Monty's podcast on Horsemanship Radio. You and Monty and your podcast guests are my company every evening while I'm feeding, cleaning, and finishing up barn chores for the day. I especially enjoyed the recent podcast 158 because so many of the guys that Monty talked about, and especially Greg Ward, were heroes of mine when I was growing up. It was really fun to be a fly on the wall listening to Monty recount all those stories. And I also enjoyed his discussion with Tanya Johnston about the deer and sigmotaxis. Thanks for all the great information you and your dad are spreading throughout the world. And thanks for making the time doing my barn chores. No chore at all. All the best, Nan Meek. Joelle Dunlap can't remember a time when she wasn't obsessed with horses. Born into a non-horsey family that moved every few years, Joelle sought out unconventional ways to bring horses into her life as a kid. Her mother's family were jockeys, and by the time that she was in her early 20s, she was galloping racehorses, starting young horses, and working at breeding farms and thoroughbred sales. She dabbled in jumping, eventing, dressage, polo, fox hunting, and reining. In 2004, she and her husband, Darius, started Square Peg Foundation to put marginalized people together with horses that also needed a second chance. They served homeless families, girls that had been trafficked, survivors of domestic abuse, but it was autism families that kept finding Square Peg, and it was the -the off-the-track thoroughbreds that needed homes. It turned out that an understanding of and a passion for classical dressage is key to building in building horses who are most effective at supporting the families at Square Peg. As a result, some world-class horsemen have supported Square Peg's work. It was like a dream come true for Joelle, and all these classical masters have been amazed at the willingness and intelligence of Square Peg thoroughbreds. Well, welcome. We've got Joelle Dunlap on the phone, and I think you're calling in from the San Francisco area. Am I right, Joelle? You're correct. We're in uh, Half Moon Bay, so on the coast just south of San Francisco. Uh, If anybody has not been there yet, go. It's Well, maybe you don't want anybody there right now, but it's beautiful (laughs) there. Beautiful there. One of my favorite parts of California along the coast. And you've got horses, so it's the most beautiful place on earth, probably. Indeed. Yeah. I love your story and I wanted to have you on. I'm so glad I heard about you and um, I don't even remember how we all met. We haven't actually met, but um, I, I think your your story is one of those that like when I grow up, I want to be Joelle. Oh, oh, oh now you're doing so well. And and just the hint is that you have not only off the track thoroughbreds, but you also have autism in the story and you put them together. So what better story is that? And I thought the first question I should start with is why off the track thoroughbreds? Why OTTBs? Well, um, that's something I can talk about for a long time, but probably the short answer is um, thoroughbreds are born around humans, um, you know, and they're, they're conceived with humans there, right? Uh, 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 They, Thoroughbreds see humans as part of their herd, unlike really any other breed as a whole. Um, and, uh, and, and so horses or people are part of their, their 
their herd, their family, their survival, their safety from the get-go. So once you you can get a thoroughbred to trust you, he has generations of of humans in his in his life. And so I find them very easy to connect with. Um, and, um, and they, they're just pleasers, you know, we've bred them for just centuries to want to lay down their lives for us. They give us everything. And so, um, so they're, 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 they're so friendly, really. Mm, that's nice. Um, and yeah. 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 And yeah, that's, that's probably the short answer. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, I think what I'm hearing is that domesticated horses really are kind of like our, or maybe our pets are born with us and not like, um, let's say the Mustangs out in Nevada where they've right. never seen something walking on two legs, uh, until they do. And then they're certainly survivalism, it kicks in and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So you're saying the opposite, that um, this is an environment mm-hmm. that they're raised in. And I love the fact that you you state something that not a lot of people who work with thoroughbreds actually say. A lot of people think that the thoroughbreds on the track are kind of glazed over and that they're used as, you know, a, a sport, right? They're not, yeah. they don't have the relationship at the track that uh, a lot of people uh, might have with their, let's say, little quarter horse back home, you know. So mm-hmm. that's interesting to me that you say that and that um, you recognize their their place with humans and humans' place. One of the things I like to point out that people say, you know, gosh, I, I like to help horses. And I always think that's kind of funny to me in that I think horses help people a lot, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the other way around. Yeah. But that's what you yeah. found. I mean, you formed this square peg foundation to help people, marginalize people, and um, you know, people who need a second chance too. And I and I guess that is the the qualities of thoroughbreds that um, are retired at such a young age. Sometimes they come out of the thoroughbred industry at three, four, five years old and still have a mm-hmm. lot of life left. How did you mm-hmm. decide that autism was the thing that really resonated well with OTTBs? Um, autism found us. You know, when we started Square Peg, we um, we we saw a, a gap. We saw people who didn't have access to horses but wanted access to horses. We saw people who, um, maybe for financial reasons or where they lived, weren't going to succeed in a traditional riding program. And we saw people who wouldn't fit into a therapeutic riding program. And we saw this big gap. And we thought, well, those are the square pegs. Those are the people that we want to serve. And we want to take, um, you know, I'd always placed uh, horses off the track. And then you had this, you had this gap. You had these horses that weren't going to fit into a sport home and maybe too much to be a pasture puff for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. So um, that, that was really the nidus of, of square peg. And what found us was autism over and over and over mm-hmm. again, because Therapeutic writing programs really at the time um, were so focused on on doing beautiful work with people with physical disabilities, Mm -hmm. and they were really good at it. Well, most people with autism don't have a physical limitation. In fact, most people with autism are very soothed by regular outdoor, you know, motion, just Mm -hmm. like just about anybody Um, And because of the social deficits, really weren't getting the play, weren't getting the recreational opportunities um, that they really needed to thrive. So, um, you know, parents just kept finding us and they kept telling other parents and we thought, holy kittens, we better learn Mm -hmm. about this autism thing and we better Mm -hmm. learn it quick. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. So the 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 interesting thing is that we we have a transition horse program too. You may or may not know mm-hmm. about our yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and we feel like we we need to with a lot of them, we need to let them become horses again. You know, when they get here straight off the track mm-hmm. and some have won mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. have won nothing, you know, that, that's why they were retired yeah. early yeah. or some have won yeah. a quarter of a million dollars, you know, and and but all of them have a a bit of a um, oh, a racy system, you know, at the time. And, and I wouldn't mm-hmm. even say it was mm-hmm. in their head. It's just a, a hypervigilance maybe that, that they sure. achieved at the track. And, and I think trainers 
uh, like to see that a little bit, you know, like to see them hyped up a little bit Mm -hmm. and they've got them on rich food and all kinds of things. So we put them out in a pasture and we get them to chill. (laughs) We, Mm -hmm. our goal is to get Mm -hmm. them to chill for the first four or six weeks they're here. And then we start Mm -hmm. back on the training. How long do you feel uh, it takes before you get them ready for an autistic person? Person with every autism. horse is different. Yeah, oh, okay. every single horse is different, and um, we're so lucky. We work really closely um, here in California with with the Karma Placement Program. Uh, they they kind of know what's really going to work for us, and they also know that we're also suckers for a hard case. So <laughs> we tend to, you know, take that one eyed horse with you know who's back at the knee, and you know, yeah. and club footed on the other foot, and um, you know, in exchange for that really, really, really good horse that's come from a great barn that just has this brilliant mind that the trainers are crazy about. Um, and so we, we get a little of both. And, um, and, uh, and even then, as you know, once they get going, sometimes they tell you, look, I just need a break. I need you to put me out in a pasture for six or seven weeks, even mm-hmm. though we've been going for 120 days. And the way I liken it that I think most people understand so that you kind of demystify this, you know, crazy thoroughbred notion yeah. is it's environment, right? So if I buy a 10 week old Australian cattle dog puppy and I live in an apartment mm-hmm. and I work 50 hours a week, <laughs> he's going to chew my carpet. You know, and he's going to shred everything. But if I have an eight, 10 week old puppy and I live out on a farm and I have two other dogs and he's with me all day and he's moving, guess what? He's going to be the best dog in the world. And people are going to say, how do you train dogs so well? And I don't. I put him in the right environment. And I think that's so true with all horses, particularly thoroughbreds, when their diets are, you know, appropriate for their work level, when you have turnout for them when you have appropriate, you know, horses for them to be turned out with. Um, they're, again, they're just so connected to humans and they're so friendly and they're such pleasers. Uh, they come around so quickly. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. That is a perfect way to describe how we can get our horses in the right environment for the right breed and, and get it right. Mm-hmm. And what is the first thing you teach your your OTTBs when they come off. It, when you get into the training mode of getting them ready to do mm. the job mm-hmm. that they're now going to do, what do you start with? Um, we do a lot of work in hand, right? Um, where every we introduce all the lateral work and all the breaks from the ground uh, in hand, really following um, a classical dressage system. So sometimes we'll do it in a cavison, sometimes we'll do it in a bridle. It really depends on the horse, but just getting them to connect with us on the ground and learn some really basic cues, um, particularly whoa, you know, which is, Mm -hmm. is, you know, people forget that an off-track thoroughbred has been ridden in front of crowds. He's seen pictures, he's seen bicycles, he, you know, weaves in and out of cars on his way back and forth to the track. Um, But, uh, you know, teaching him to accept a soft contact and to, to get his legs underneath him, that's going to be slightly new. Um, and uh, um, we're so lucky. We work with some really fantastic um, classical um, uh, uh, mentors, um, including the Valenza family in Portugal, you know, pre-COVID. Fabulous. They would come out once or twice a year. And I mean, how beautiful to be mentored by these these amazing people and they're always blown away at how generous our thoroughbreds are, you know, mm-hmm. and we have several that are trained to high school. So they have Piaf, they have Passage, you know, in a really soft classical way. It's not going to get them pinned in a dressage class. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, at, you know, and they look at them and they go, this horse is not, you know, his confirmation isn't such that he should be able to carry himself this way. Uh-huh. But I said, but nobody told the horse that and, and they just giggle and they're so kind and, um, uh, you know, and it's always fun to show people that your breed can do things that, that people, you know, even really educated people didn't mm-hmm. think that they're capable of. So, so I'm great that part, probably yeah. more than I should. <laughs> oh, no, no, not at all. Because you are <laughs> born into it. I, I, we had said in your bio that you don't remember a time when you weren't obsessed with horses and, and you do have jockeys in your family so that you've, you know mm-hmm. what you're talking about when you say you've uh, been on the backs of these young thoroughbreds, you've done some different 
disciplines on them as well. So uh, it makes total sense why you were doing that. But you also have another side to you too. So without getting too much into your horsey background, I want to get into your horsey book. So tell me a little, yeah, (laughs) I know you're writing and I know that you're coming out with a book. So I want to hear a little preview. I want a little, a little exclusive here on Horsemanship Radio. (laughs) Do you have a working title or a, a final title? I do. Uh, 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 The final title is A Damn Fine Hand. And, um, you know, our our autism and even classical dressage um, mentor has been um, uh, Rupert Isaacson and and Ileana Lorenz. And and Rupert wrote the story, The Horse Boy, about his his journey with his son, Rowan, who's 19 now. um, And they're dear friends. And I was working on this book. And... um, and uh, and I the working title was Gallop Girl because I thought that was funny and I liked the alliteration and Gossip Girl was kind of all the rage. And uh, and he said, no, he said, Joel, you have this turn of phrase and I'm not sure whether it's a California thing or what he said. But when you really respect someone, you say that person's a damn fine hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he said, that's the title of your book. So I'll give him credit for that one. <laughs> good. It's good. And it, yeah, the subtitling I have is a story of women writing for their lives. Yeah. That's pretty intriguing yeah. too. Are you going to tell us? A yeah. Little? So it's a, it's a short story that got out of control. Um, <laughs> it, it's actually two short stories that got out of control. Um, one of my dearest friends uh, is an assistant trainer and um uh, an exercise rider, and she was involved in a head-on collision on the track where uh, a horse got loose and bolted into a horse that she was working. Uh-huh. And um, and uh, uh, I was I was sitting at breakfast with my veterinarian, who spent a lot of years on the track, and my husband and my dad. And my phone just starts jumping off the table because. Um, uh, all these women at the track said, oh, my God, you know, Colleen's really been hurt badly and Joelle needs to know and she needs to get, you know, to the because we're like family um, and she needs to be there at the hospital with her. And I started thinking about, um, you know, women in the horse world. Uh, these are women that I hadn't seen in years, you know, and somehow they all found my number and started calling and just how everybody came together for this woman who got injured in a way that, you know, there but for the grace of God go I, right? It could have been any of us and how quickly all these women came together to to support her. And she did recover. Um, both horses died. It was just, you know, it was one of wow. those spectacularly tragic things. Mm-hmm. And um and uh and that whole experience of of you know her getting to Stanford and um uh, was anyway, it was, you know, it was something that was really in my mind. And, um, and then I had this idea to tell the story of, of a retiring racehorse who, um, just ends up in the slaughter pipeline just through, uh, you know, just bad luck. And I, you know, I got thinking about, you know, Black Beauty was a story that 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 changed everything um, right. because it started the Humane Society movement, and it That's was true. because it was the first time that somebody gave a horse a voice, a first yep. person voice. And, and I thought, what if I tell this story, yeah, from from the horse's voice, and um, and show him going through these things that he doesn't understand, um, right. and none of it is his fault. And a damn fine hand is what happened when those two stories ran into each other. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have said ran into each other. That was a terrible <laughs> metaphor. But anyway. We uh, got you. We got you, though. But yeah, but it sparked something right there. So, no, that's that's lovely. And uh, people will, I hope that teases a little bit and make it summer reading. I hope we'll get it for our, our oh, summer reading. I hope so. Life. Yeah. Trafalgar Square Books is considering uh, publishing it, and they've the asked me to. Uh, yeah, they 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 uh, they have another week to take a look at it, and they'll okay. decide whether or not they'll publish it. So well, it's a super exciting time. That is, and that's exciting that you could give us a little teaser on that too. And uh, so we have to have you back, so we get to hear, you know, how it com- comes out too. I if if a somebody who has uh, somebody who has 
autism in their life, how would they get a hold of you or what would you want somebody to do who could uh, maybe be a part of Square Peg? How do they contact sure. you? Sure. Um, we, uh, we have two farms, one in Half Moon Bay, one in Sonoma. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so going to uh, squarepegfoundation.org, um, there is a um, there are two forms. There's a volunteer sheet and there's a families interested in services sheet. Um, and, uh, for people all over the world, um, we have, we're associated with the, the, the horse boy foundation and, um, and autism is, is, is so tricky. And every family's, um, every family's journey, um, is, is so different and so unique. Um, but it shouldn't be alone. And that's the one thing that I think that horses teach us that horses are always their best when they're connected and they're, they're in a herd and humans are the same way. So connecting people is is a joy in my life to do. And, um, and that's, that's the best advice that I have for, um, can I tell a quick story about Mm -hmm. autism and, and what we do? Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, we, uh, uh, I was at a, a luncheon with Dr. Temple Grandin, who is my so amazing, right? And uh, my husband is one of those people who like jumps in the front row of everything and asks the first question. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and I'm the person like sitting, you know, over close to the door. <laughs> <Yeah. know? laughs> and um, so just a moment. Um, and uh, anyway, so we're at this luncheon. And, uh, and she, and, and he volunteers a question and he says, Dr. Grannon, what was it about, you know, being at a barn that really changed your life? And what she said really shifted everything in our whole organization at Square Peg Foundation. She didn't say it was the horses and the regular rhythmic movement. It wasn't this. She said the barn was the first place I had friends. Mm, right. Yeah. Right. And we forget how important the social connection is with our horses. And, um, yeah, being in a barn where we feel useful and connected and friendly and we can share our stories. And, um, and, and I think that is really the best of who we are. Mm. And um, so, yeah, so how, and whether it's at a barn or whether it's at a, you know, a model car club or, you know, whatever that intrinsic interest is, finding your tribe and finding your place where you can, where you can be in tribe and just swapping stories and enjoying, um, that's really, that's really where you make a big difference. Mm. Well, I hope people will um, take that to heart and look up Square Peg Foundation and all that you're doing and and support as, as able. Are you a 501c3, a nonprofit? We are. We are. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. And have perfect. been since 2004. Yeah. Good girl. Yeah. Like I said, I want to be Joelle Dunlap when I grow up. So that's pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> pretty fun what you're doing there. And I, you know, I, it, it, it seems like an amazing life, but I know that there's a lot of sweat equity that you put into that. And I affirm you and thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do and for keeping it fun and light and sweet and smart. Um, I really appreciate it. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, do you ride with a whip or use one on the ground? Do you call it a whip or a crop or something else? Do you think what you call it is important and if so, why? Monty's answer. Since 1949, I have not ridden with a whip. I often use the giddy-up rope, which is a collection of cotton yarn braided soft so that it can cause no pain. It is my opinion that striking the horse causing pain is ultimately counterproductive in many ways. I've been able to achieve 11 world championships without the use of a whip. My position has been clear for my entire adult life that causing pain to the flight animal is virtually never productive. Obviously, treating an injury can be painful and surgery can produce pain, but whipping to improve performance is a fallacy. 
For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Listen up, horse owners. If your horses can't get out on green grass for their daily dose of omegas, Purina's got you covered. The Purina team of PhD equine nutritionists have two new products that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, and they taste better than many sources. Looking at you, fish oil. Try the new Purina Omega Match Timothy-based Ration Balancer or Ahi Flower Oil Supplement and see for yourself why these are among some of the best omegas that nature offers. It can take science and love together, each pulling their weight to help your horses live their best lives. Put our research to the test at PurinaMills.com forward slash Omega Match. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. We just finished up at, at Western States Expo in Sacramento, and he got to meet a lot of two-legged and four-legged people. It was a lot of fun. But here we are. We're sitting right on the cusp of the movement. I don't know if you can get a ticket at this point, but it is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, June 18, 19, 20. And if you've missed the movement, you better move on and get next year. Put your name in at uh, admin at montyroberts.com uh, to a- inquire about next year's days. And then we have 21 through 25. We have a Monty special training, and that's in June at the farm here in Solvang. Then July, we have at the um, the the 4th of July weekend, which is totally appropriate for veterans and first responders, July 2 through 4 is our horse sense and healing for those that are uh, beset with post-traumatic stress. Then we have our introductory course of horsemanship, and that's July 12 through 23. It's the full-blown two-week version. Get her all done. Get ready for the exams. Then in August, we have 2 through 13. We have our Gently Wild Horse course, and that's the 10-day one, not the five-day version, the 10-day really get to where you almost got those first one, maybe you do, get them saddled. And then we've got August 16th through 20, another Monty special training. So you get a lot of opportunities to see Monty this summer because guess what? He's at home now. I can't believe, mostly. He was in Sacramento yesterday, but we had a lot of fun. Wow. He's home. Woohoo! Woohoo. <laughs> great. And great. if you couldn't put commit all of that to memory... Hop on over again, MontyRoberts.com. That's kind of the, the place to go, MontyRoberts.com. It's easy to remember. Yeah. Or you can give them a call over there at Flag Us Up Farms at 805-688-6288. And of course, that phone number can be found at MontyRoberts.com. Back over there. You can keep looping back. Good. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. Well, everybody had a favorite morning drive show in the days we all listened to radio. They were goofy, funny, and entertaining. You can have that again, only this time it focuses on life with horses. We are here every weekday on your podcast player. Search for Horses in the Morning and come join us. We are a little goofy, hopefully funny and entertaining, and you might learn something along the way, too. We are the world's leading daily podcast about horses since 2010 with over 2,600 episodes for you to binge on. Subscribe today. What are you waiting for? Pull your phone out of your pocket, blow off the hay, and subscribe to Horses in the Morning. And that's about a wrap up for today. And if you want links or details about today's show, which is episode number 185, you can go to Monty Roberts, horsemanshipradio.com. That's the one. Horsemanshipradio.com. Keep going back to Monty Roberts, but we have Horsemanshipradio.com. We have Horsemanshipradio.com. You can also go to MontyRoberts.com because right there on the home page, when you go to MontyRoberts.com, the podcast is on the home page. You just scroll down a tiny little bit, and right there's Debbie with her beautiful chestnut right. horse and her bright red shirt. And yeah, we're sort of matchy matchy there. Huh? Matchy matchy. <laughs> so you can also find it there. And we love your feedback. And one of our favorite ways to get your feedback is on social media. So if you haven't done so already, head on over to Facebook, search for Monty Roberts, the one with the little blue check mark, and follow that one. Or if you are a tweeter or an Instagrammer, Monty's handle on both is Monty underscore Roberts. 
So check those out today. I know that the Instagram is one of your faves right now, isn't it? It's beautiful. It, it's so simple. Take a picture, put a caption, <laughs> hashtag it. Then done. You're done. Who doesn't want to look at pictures of cool horses and people having fun with cool horses? Exactly. Exactly. There you should go. get the app though too, because there's lots of pretty pictures there. That's true. Good point. And if you want to uh, get the Horse Radio Network shows with you wherever you go, download the free Horse Radio Network app. Go to your app store, search Horse Radio Network, and download it today. It's free and easy to use. You can choose to get all of the Horse Radio Network shows, and there is a heap of them. Or you can pick and choose, like, give me Horsemanship Radio, and it'll <laughs> download your, your, your phone each time it comes out, and you'll never miss an episode. And you can also listen on your favorite podcatcher. I'm not going to say you can listen on iTunes anymore because iTunes, podcasts on iTunes is going away. You can still listen on your Apple device, but Apple has created a different place for them to live. See your Apple device to find out more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're so dang popular though, you guys. Remember when people didn't know what a podcast was? Mm -hmm. And I had to put radio in the name, Horsemanship yes, Radio. that's right. Now people are like, that's not a podcast, not a radio. I'm like, okay, you got it. They're here. There you go. And and I thank you for those sponsors who've been with us too and and lived through all that pod was a podcast era, you know? But um I love our sponsors and Jay Michelson from uh, Hands on Gloves has just been a king. He really is super helpful. He's got all our interns and our certified instructors scrubbing and rubbing on all their horses and they're loving it. Lots of Lots of twitching noses out there. Happy horses. And MontyRobertsUniversity.com is our reason for being here, too, to get the mission statement out there. But be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horsemanship Radio. I do on the Horse Radio Network. And that is at www.horseradionetwork.com. But here's what I want you to do. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 